C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, said this, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing. He is getting the drains right, stopping the leaks in the roof, and so on. You knew these jobs needed to be done, but you're so surprised at what else is going on. Presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. This analogy by C.S. Lewis is decidedly a biblical one. As the apostle Peter said, and you come to him a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. And you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Our series this weekend, as you all know, has been the idea of building a firm foundation or how firm a foundation and the elders have assigned me to speak to you this morning on this topic of being a living stone it's been so good to be here this weekend and enjoy your fellowship and the encouragement that we have had one for another and to be able to study god's word on this vital topic uh, this is a new series for me and there is a sense of uh, some trepidation when I'm assigned topics that uh, maybe I haven't preached exactly that same way, but there's also a sense of excitement in putting together something a little new and different that I haven't done before in a series. So you can let me know privately, you don't have to spread this around, but if you think this has worked pretty good, tell me, and I might use it again somewhere else in another meeting. I sort of think it's coming together pretty good but we'll find out these last two lessons if this is worthy to repeat somewhere. But I appreciate the opportunity the shepherds have given me to be able to share this material with you and to talk this morning in the Bible study hour about being a living stone. And so if you're looking at your handout notes and you notice there, for those of you that might be here for the first time, that there are blanks, I'm going to give you the answer to the blanks on the PowerPoint, or at least hopefully. Once in a while, Norma says, that's my wife is with me, she says, uh, you know, honey, you, you messed up. The blanks didn't fit the PowerPoint. That may have already happened this week, and if so, I apologize. But uh, nevertheless, we'll try to match those up a little bit and be able to help you. So there's some questions we want to ask about being a living stone. Who is the living stone? And why are we living stones? And how are we living stones? And then, so what? What does it all mean? to be living stones. Now, before we get into those questions, the first thing that I want us to think about for just a moment is this expression, living stone. Now, we're used to that. If you're a Bible student and you've read this passage before, we just blithely say that we're living stones. But isn't that like the ultimate oxymoron? A living stone? It, it doesn't seem to go together, does it? I mean, on the surface, it sounds more like saying jumbo shrimp or bittersweet or clearly misunderstood or we had a small crowd today, oxymorons. And so we're talking about a living stone. One commentator put it this way. He said a stone might be described in many ways by its size, its shape, its color. To describe it as a living stone is most unusual. It does not seem like these two words, living and stone, would go together. In fact, you would have to say that such a stone is rare and a unique stone in the world of common. This stone would stand out as vastly different and incredibly special and so unique and that it goes against who we like to be. We want to fit in. 
not stand out, but if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you will stand out. And Jesus followed his father, and he stood out. And so that's that commentator's idea of the idea of a living stone. That is, it is the Holy Spirit's way of saying that you're unique, you're special, you're different, you're to stand out. You're not to like to be the other stones. And with a lot of people in this world getting stoned, we're different. We're a different kind of stone. We are living stones. And so who is this that we're talking about that are living stones? Well, this is pretty easy to answer, I think, probably for the majority of us in the room, because the text even tells us here that it's God's people who are the living stones that compose a spiritual house, that you also, he says, as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. And it's interesting here, this phrase, are being built up that this is a pre present participle and it indicates the idea of continuous action, of action that is still going on, that you are being built up. You may have heard of the uh, gospel preacher who lives over in a Tampa area named Collie Caldwell. A few of you heard of that name. He has a wonderful commentary on the book of Ephesians. And I looked this up when he was talking about this idea of a living stone. And he says, being built up is enlarging and strengthening and growing through patient effort. It refers to the miracle additions that the salvation of souls being saved. And it refers to the establishment of strength through teaching those who are already Christians. Both areas of growth have to do with the spiritual progress of the body. And so we're speaking this morning to those that are in the body, that they're in the house of God, that are living stones and are being built up. As we said in one of our lessons the other night, the church is a people and not a place. And I know that in the world, and maybe sometimes we accommodatively, we refer to our building as a church. But I hope that we all know that the building is not the church. It's those that are inside the building that are the church. And these are the ones that are being talked about here in the text as being the living stones. God's people who compose a spiritual house. That's who. It is those who are born of water and of the Spirit. And so there's something special that, that happens here for us to become this living stone. Jesus said to Nicodemus, most assuredly I say to you, unless born, one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now I understand I'm switching metaphors here just a bit, but I want to just make the point here that not anybody can be a stone that's put into this building and built upon this foundation. It is special people, it is unique people, it's people that have been born again by the teaching of the Holy Spirit via the Word of God and have been immersed in water for the remission of their sins. Not only that, it is those who are spiritual people. And I want to camp on this just a little bit in the next couple of points because the text says you're living stones and you're being built up a spiritual house. Ladies and gentlemen, the church is different. The church is different than any other house in the world, any other institution. In fact, I don't even really like to refer to the church as an institution. I like to think of it more as a relationship that we have with God and that we have with one another. But we are a spiritual house. Obviously, the word spiritual is derived from the word spirit. Thayer comments, it is a body of Christians as pervaded by the spirit and the will of God. And so we are spiritual people that are built up a spiritual house. When I was working on this point, I was reminded of a quote by William J. Bennett in his book, The Book of Virtues, where he says, I submit to you that the real crisis of our time is spiritual. And that's true. The crisis of our time is spiritual. It's the crisis of our time in our country it's the crisis of our time in our homes. And unfortunately, it is a crisis for our time in many churches today. And in some cases, even in those that have the identification Church of Christ. It is easy to get away from the mission and the ministry, which is based upon spiritual precepts and principles. 
We're not like the YMCA. We're not like the Red Cross. We're not like the Rotary Club or the Kiwanis Club or some other type of organization that seeks to do good. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is built for spiritual reasons and it's built, built upon a spiritual foundation and for a spiritual purpose. So that's who. We are a spiritual people that compose and comprise a spiritual house. Well, secondly, let's turn to the why. And really, the word here is used, the idea of building up yourselves. He, and Jude uses this too in Jude 20, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. That this word is used as not only as the idea of a spiritual house and building as a noun, but building as a verb. And so we are building up. We're not only a building, but we are building up. We are growing. Kali suggested that idea as well. And so why are we living stones? Well, we are living stones so that we might enjoy spiritual blessings. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. What a wonderful promise. What a wonderful thought to think of spiritual blessings. Sometimes when I'm doing a Bible class and we're not going to we're not going to have a feedback uh, so much today, unless you want to say amen, that'll be okay. But I'm not going to ask questions to be answered. But sometimes when I'm doing this verse, I like to go around the room and say, what spiritual blessings can you think of? And it's very easy to come up with 15 or 20 spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. And immediately we think of the idea of forgiveness of sins and our relationship with God and our communion with Christ and our indwelling of the Holy Spirit and, of course, the fellowship that we have with one another. There are so many spiritual blessings, the privilege of prayer that we enjoy, spiritual blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. And so we're living stones that we might enjoy those blessings. Charles Spurgeon once referred to the British evangelist R.C. Chapman as the saintliest man I ever knew. The story is told that one morning that Chapman was asked, how are you feeling today? And Chapman replied, I'm burdened this morning. Well, his happy countenance belied those words. And so the questioner in some surprise said, really, Mr. Chapman, are you really burdened? And Chapman replied, yes, but it's a wonderful burden. It is an overabundance of blessings for which I cannot find enough time or words to express my gratitude. He saw that the questioner was puzzled by that. And Chapman then added with a smile, he said, I'm referring to Psalm 68, 19, which describes my condition. In that verse, the Father of Heaven reminds me that He daily loads us with His benefits. Isn't that a great thought? That He daily loads us with His benefits. That we have so many spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. That's why we are living stones. Not only that, we are living stones that we might offer spiritual sacrifices. And the text points that out here in 1 Peter 2, 5. And so this is opposed to carnal sacrifices. It's opposed to animal sacrifices. It is a worship that is internal. It is a worship that is spiritual. And so we come together on this Lord's Day to offer spiritual sacrifices in a unique way as we worship God in spirit and in truth. And God has created us and built this spiritual house and we as individual living stones comprise it to offer up these sacrifices in the house of God. Not only that, I would suggest that we are living stones, that we might walk after the Spirit. It has to do with our daily discipleship. Our direction and our desires and our deeds are not to be of the flesh, but they are to be of the Spirit. And so Paul would say in Galatians 5, 16, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Then he goes on to say in that text that the, the flesh and the Spirit are contrary one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would or the things that you wish. 
Now, you don't have to raise your hand on this, but have you ever had something happen and you would like to give someone a piece of your mind? Or maybe someone cuts you off on the interstate and you want to shake your fist at them a little bit? Hopefully, you keep your fist closed when you do that, but if you went that far. Some people, I've noticed, don't do that. You know, they wave at you, but not with all their fingers, you know. But uh, anyway, you know what I mean by that. Certainly, hopefully, none of us here would do that. Now, I will admit that when, if I'm at a traffic light, and you know, especially making a left turn, you only got so long to turn, especially in a city like this, and if someone's sitting there on their phone or not moving, I'm pretty quick to hit the horn. I don't blare it for a long time, but just toot the horn a little bit. My wife always, she said, honey, don't do that. They might shoot us. <laughs> and she always knows some story of road rage where someone got shot. And I said, well, honey, they're in front of us. They're not going to turn around out the window and shoot us. You don't have time to duck. She's not, she's not buying that. She didn't want me to blow the horn. But that's what I would do. And some people might would do other things. Now, you don't want to be the kind of guy that someone said, I'll tell you what, I'd like to give him a piece of my mind. And a friend that knew him well said, you don't have any to give. All right? So I don't know about that. But there are things that we would do in the flesh. We can't do that. We're, we're living stones. We're to be different. We're to walk after the Spirit. Not only that, we are to serve in the newness of spirit. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 6, he said, But now we've been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Our ministry has a spiritual basis, a spiritual purpose, and a spiritual result. And so we are to serve in the newness of the Spirit. Now, if I'm to use this spiritual house analogy for just a second, why, why do you have a church building? Well, you think about it, it serves a purpose, right? Just like any building has a function, your home serves a purpose. And buildings are built to serve a purpose for people. Well, we as a spiritual house are to serve a purpose. And we are to serve God's purpose here upon this earth. And so we serve in the newness of spirit. And while there may be physical acts of goodness and mercy that issue themselves from within the spirit, they are by nature spiritual. They are by nature spiritual works. And then we are living stones in order that we might be a living sacrifice. And so then a familiar passage to us in Romans chapter 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And so we're a living sacrifice. We're a sacrifice that seeks to serve God day by day in the relationships that we have, not only with one another, but in relationships we have with those in the world. And so this is the why, to be a living sacrifice. He goes on to say in that passage, not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This indicates something that we talked about a few minutes ago of the idea of continued action in the building. And so it's a continued process. There's a continued renewing, and there's a continued challenge not to be conformed. There's a, there's a continued challenge to be transformed. It's not a one-time act. It's not something that just magically and mystically happens when one comes out of the waters of baptism, that the transformation, and you're done with that. Well, discipleship is daily. It's not an event, it's a process that takes place. And so it is a daily renewing of your mind. I love the J.B. Phillips translation there. He says, don't let the world squeeze you into its own mold. Now, that's a challenge, isn't it? Because the world would mold us as it would. You remember, uh, <clears throat> some of you, maybe we have some uh, parents who have young children. If you do, I don't know if parents still do this or not. When our kids were little, you know, they, they would like, Norma would make like jello and put it in these molds 
uh, that looks like stars or shapes or animals and put it in the freezer and had these frozen treats for them, and they love that. And of course, whatever you put it in, if you got the mold that looks like a star and you pour the jello in there and you freeze it, it's gonna come out looking like a star, or if it's a can, a can, or whatever it is. Well, when we get poured into the mold of carnality, into the mold of the world, and the way the world walks and talks and dress and attitudes and actions, we're gonna look like the world. We're not gonna look like the spiritual house that God is want wanting to build. So these are at least a few reasons why we are to be, as it's called, living stones. Now, how does this take place? Well, it takes place through Christ, the master builder. And we've already talked in previous lessons where Jesus said, I will build my church. He's the builder. He built his church. It, it, it belongs to him. He possesses it. And so we have a passage like this in Colossians chapter 2. He says, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted, and there it is again, and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And so Christ is the builder. He has built the house, and we are continuing to lay these living stones, and we are being built up by the master builder. Not only that, we are built up by the master builder through the word. And it's through the word that we get spiritual understanding. And so Paul would pray for the Colossians. He said, we do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding and that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And so I've highlighted there, and you see the idea of knowledge and understanding and knowledge of God. This all speaks of the idea of us growing in knowledge. And as we noted the other night, this comes about through our faith and the faith, Romans 5, 1 and 2. And the faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so then a very familiar passage would be 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction which is in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, and do every good work. And so the word will direct us and completely equip us for all that we need that we might be built up. But also I would submit to you that is living stones that we are built up through spiritual fellowship. In Acts chapter 2, a very familiar passage to the people of God on the establishment of the church, sometimes maybe we stop at about verse 41 or so, and we stop with repent and be baptized in verse 38. But if you read on down about verse 42, it says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers, then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed, now all who believed, were together, and they had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord and in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And so I highlighted, you notice there, the words that had to do with in common and together and one accord and house to house. There was a fellowship that was taking place with these early Christians that was important. And that's one of the ways that we grow. You know, it's a mistake to think that we can grow apart from that fellowship. And I'll say a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. So that is the how. That leads us then to say, well, Ken, you know, you've been, uh, you've been preaching here for 20 minutes or so. So what? what about, so what this living stone metaphor and this building up metaphor? What does that mean to me today in 2024 in a practical way? Or to put it another way, what is the wherefore of these precepts and principles that we've been talking about? Four thoughts for you. Number one, together we compose an edifice of enlightenment in a sin-darkened world. You know, our age is not 
totally unlike the New Testament world. A lot of us, like myself, that grew up in the, in the 50s and, and early 60s, tend to think about how bad things are today, morally, in so many ways, and how so many things have changed. And we may forget our history a little bit, and how Christianity was born into a Greco-Roman world that was morally bankrupt. It was a spiritually dark time. And a simple perusal, and we read this, I think, the other night in Romans 1, will show how depraved the Gentile world was. And a study of that culture from, from secular history verifies those facts. Do you know that all but one of the Roman emperors was a homosexual? Now, as bad as our morality is today in so many ways, I, I don't think we're even ready yet to accept a president that was an avowed homosexual. Now, we might be. I might be wrong. We might be getting close to that. I don't know. Nero married a 12-year-old boy and prayed him through the streets of Rome at a wedding ceremony. Sickening, isn't it? But that's how morally bankrupt the world was in Paul's day. So we may not be quite that bad yet. And yet to these Christians in that time, they were told to hold forth the word of life, to let their light shine in this sin-darkened world. When we read a passage like this in 2 Corinthians 4 where Paul would say, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord, and ourselves your bond service for his sake. For it is the God who commanded us to shine, commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. We are to be like that city that is set on a hill, letting our light shine. I don't know if you all do vacation at Bible school here or not. I've been privileged the last few years to be in Ontario, Canada for the vacation Bible school the Wellimport Church has. And they're a little congregation of 40 or 50 people, but they put on the best VBS you've ever seen in your life. I mean, it is incredible what a great job that little group does. And these little kids will sing their hearts out and sing, you know, this little Christian light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. And it, it just, it's just so invigorating and exciting to hear these little ones sing with all their might. But it occurred to me one time, you know, that's not just a little kid's song for VBS or in the, in the little kids' classes. That's a sentiment that ought to prevail among adults, among moms and dads, and grandmas and grandpas, that we're letting our light shine, and people can see it. And so we are building up a spiritual house that we might be an edifice of enlightenment in a sin-darkened world. Not only that, together we compose an edifice of education to a spiritually uneducated world. Now, when I was doing this outline, I started to put a spiritually ignorant world. But I know how some people are offended at words, and so I thought, well, I'll not use the word ignorant, but I am reminded that the American humorist Will Rogers once said, you know, everybody's ignorant just on different subjects. And I know some people that have PhDs and are brilliant people in their discipline that are spiritually ignorant, that are spiritually uneducated. And sadly, there are too many people today in the world that know absolutely nothing about God or Jesus or the Bible or about spiritual matters. And so as we're building up a spiritual house, brethren, we're to be that house, that edifice of education to a world that doesn't know the Lord, that people that can come to know Him through us. And so we have a passage like in Ephesians 5, 17 that says, Be not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Or in 2 Timothy 2, 15, the old King James says, Study to show yourself approved unto God. 
The newer versions probably translate that more correctly to give diligence, but it still suggests the idea of diligence that has to do with getting into the Word. Or in Psalm 119 or verse 18, open mine eyes and I might see wondrous things out of your law. When people come into our house, they need to see Jesus. Now, when I say come into our house, I could be meaning actually the church building as they join with us and they see Jesus. And when they hear comments in class, they don't hear pejorative comments that are hypercritical of other people that are not here, but they hear comments that have to do with God's Word that will educate them and help them come to better understand who Jesus is and what the Word is about. Or when they see us out as living stones in the community, then they can come to know who Jesus is. I was <clears throat> over at the, the Skyview Church a couple years ago, and they were doing a little project there, and one of the ladies there was real good at calligraphy, and so they come up with this idea of getting a bunch of stones uh, with this idea that we're living stones and putting Bible verses on them, and then they, on one side and the other side, they put Skyview Church of Christ and their address and phone number, maybe their web page or something, and so this lady did all these rocks and stones and so the members were taking these stones out and just put them in different places where people you know public places whatever where they see a flower bed with rocks like you see a lot of times and just put them there so people might come. I thought well that's kind of a cool idea now I haven't got back with them to see if anybody's picked up a rock and come to church uh, hopefully no one has come and thrown a rock at anybody um, never had that happen but that what an idea of being living stones and looking for a way that we might educate people. Teddy Roosevelt was right when he said a thorough understanding of the Bible is better than a college education. And we need to appreciate that and understand that with our young people. We're all concerned about our kids getting a good education and going to school and, and, and graduating and going to a university or college somewhere and, and getting a, a degree and getting a good job and pursuing a career and doing well in life and being successful. But what about their spiritual education? Are we an edifice of education spiritually in our homes to our children and to our grandchildren? Are they learning the will and the word of God from us? Are we still, as it used to be said many years ago, a people of the book? It's a question for us to contemplate and to think about as people come into our house. Do they see Jesus and do they learn the Bible? Thirdly, together we compose an edifice of encouragement to disheartened and discouraged brethren. Now, I really didn't have to say disheartened and discouraged brethren because we're an edifice of encouragement to everybody. Whether we're discouraged today or not discouraged, we do become an edifice of encouragement to all of us. Surveys tend to show that most people think the country's on the wrong track. And, but a lot of people are not sure what that means. But it's obvious that there is a malaise in our culture, an uneasiness, unrest. There's a search for meaning and a search for something more. When people come into our house, do they feel a sense of togetherness, a sense of love, a sense of concern? Do they experience our compassion and our care, not only for them, but for one another? You know, when Jesus illustrated to the disciples of John 13 the idea of humility and servicehood by washing the disciples' feet. Even Peter, who would soon deny him, and Judas, who would soon betray him, he got done with that, and he tried to explain to him, you know what I've done. And then he went on to say in verses uh, 34 and 35 that you should love one another as I have loved you. And he said, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And so do people see that and do they sense that encouragement and that care and concern and love that we have one for another? Paul would write in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 14, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with all. And then Hebrews 3 and verse 13, but encourage one another daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened 
by the deceitfulness of sin. What are folks hearing in our Bible classes and our sermons? Is it a message that points the way, provides help and hope, and lifts people to a better way of thinking? Together, we encourage one another. It seems like to me, uh, and I, I step back from what we normally call full-time lo located work in 2018, and for three years we traveled full-time. We were in, uh, I think, 36 states, 10 countries, and uh, 48 congregations during a three-year period. Um, and ironically and crazily enough, it, part of it was right in the heart of COVID. But we didn't have a home, literally. We, we had our stuff in storage, had no home, so we had to, you got to live somewhere. So we went out to Montana and spent some time this summer in 2020 and, you know, some time in the mountains and so forth. But we visited a lot of churches all during that period. And since that period, in gospel meetings in different places. And it seems like everywhere I go, there's kind of this post-COVID malaise of every church has lost some people. I don't know about here at Bumby if you've lost anybody or not. Maybe you have. And there may be, is this being live streamed this morning? It has the other surgery. So maybe some of your home. Now, I want to be careful, those of the hundreds and thousands of you that are home watching this, all right, that some of you may be unable physically to get out. And some are sick this morning, and some uh, are incapacitated in some way. So I'm not talking to you. I'm glad we have technology where we can speak to you this morning. But if you're a person that's just lazy and you want to sit around in your pajamas and drink coffee and stay home instead of getting dressed and come to church, when you know good and well you're going to put on your clothes and go to work tomorrow or go out this afternoon and go to the store or go out and eat, then what's wrong with you? I mean, what in the world are you thinking? You need to be here with everybody else. You need to be here and enjoy the fellowship and the encouragement. That, that's what it, that's part of what it's all about. Yes, we're here to worship God, and I understand that there are unique situations that we might be in, and I can praise God anywhere. I can praise God out in the woods or on the riverbank or at home and sing, and I can think about the Lord and read the Bible. I understand that. But we're commanded to assemble ourselves together, and when we are physically and mentally able to do so, we ought to do that. We ought to be here, and we ought to be an edifice of encouragement to one another. And you may say, well, I'm encouraged by being at home listening to you. Well, what about those that are here, and they know you're not here? Are they encouraged? How are you encouraging them? And so maybe you just being here serves as an encouragement to those that are here. And I, I just throw that out for you to think about being an edifice of encouragement. And then the last one is, together we compose an edifice of edification to our church family. And so Paul would write, 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Edify one another. Romans 14 and 19 tells us that edification elicits harmony among its members and peace and tranquility. As living stones, we are joined together to form a solid, sound, spiritual house that can withstand any storm, endure any assault, and can overcome any challenge. Barclay said, the Christian is likened to a living stone and the church to a living edifice into which it is built. Clearly this means, he writes, that Christianity is a community. The individual Christian finds his place truly only when he is built into that edifice. And then to buttress my previous point, Barclay says, solitary religion is ruled out as an impossibility. C.E.B. Cranfield writes, the freelance Christian who would be a Christian but is too superior, in quotes, to belong to the visible church on earth is one of its many forms, is simply, as he says, a contradiction in terms. We are to edify one another. And the word edify, the Greek word that is there, edify, means build up, and it's from that word we get edifice, that we are an edifice. And that spiritual edifice is that which is built up 
this spiritual house. Being a living stone. That's what we individually are likened to. There's a famous story I would like to share in closing, and it comes out of ancient Sparta. It's very possibly uh, fictitious, but as the fable or the story goes, the Spartan king once boasted to a visiting monarch about the walls of Sparta. And the monarch was excited to see these mighty walls of Sparta that the king was talking about. And as he looked around, he couldn't see any walls anywhere. And finally he said to the Spartan king, he said, where are these walls about which you boast so much? And his host then pointed at the magnificent bodyguard of troops that he had. And he said, these are the walls of Sparta. Every man is a brick. Well, the point is clear. As long as a brick lies by itself, it's useless. It only becomes of use when it is incorporated into a building. And so it is with the individual Christian. If we are to realize our destiny, we must not remain alone. We must be built in to the fabric of this building, the spiritual temple, the spiritual house of God. May God bless the South Bumby Church and all of us that seek to serve him as being built up a spiritual house to be a living stone. May God bless you.